and you've got your antidepressants and everything back in shot. Here, this is intentional. Yeah, doesn't look too messy. No. Oh, yeah. I am depressed. I am depressed. I am depressed. Um, they need to be spaced differently. I'm so sorry. Sorry. Right. Uh, I am depressed. Content warning for whatever place that takes us to. I'm depressed. Fun fact of the day. But what is depression? Well, it's common. In 1990, the WHO identified major depression as the fourth leading cause of worldwide disease. It currently affects 5% of adults, or approximately 280 million people total, or everyone in the USA except California. If, if, if. And it has physiological components, which means something is literally happening in the brain. We know that the something that is happening has to do with serotonin, a neurotransmitter, but actually the debate continues as to the exact mechanisms at play. In reality, because a depression diagnosis is almost always based on reporting symptoms and because SSRIs, antidepressants, or other treatments often work, we can combat depression without fully understanding what it is. But what does it feel like? If you read definitions or checklists, you get a low mood and aversion to activity, which sounds a little Wikipedia. How about, how would I put it? Inescapable sadness and defeat. How about the absolute shame and indignity and self-loathing? What about inability itself? The feeling of being unable all the time in ways that make you ashamed and embarrassed and sad and defeated and tired and irritable and bad company. It's sort of self-fulfilling that way. A diffuse feeling, but somehow surprisingly consistent with your own sane and sober thoughts and feelings. Just so much bleaker. Thoughts and feelings that can cause you to contemplate the terrible darkness of just ending it all, because why not? Whatever, there'll be something about you that's the weakest point. That's enough out of them. That was a bit depressing, wasn't it? Well, in this video, we're actually going to dispel some myths about mental illness and hopefully tackle some stigma, as well as try to answer the question of what mental illness is. It's this hand gesture. It's the, it's the iguanodon. No, yeah, I'm an iguanodon. What does it mean to be mentally ill? Do we know? How do we know that we know? Let's put it another way. Why is mental illness a category? Is it just a well-intentioned line across the kind of care you need so we don't accidentally send you to the obstetrics part of the outpatients building? Is this category helpful? And for that matter, what is a category? And can we fully trust the ways that we develop categories? Given that we operate under so many complex systems, many of which are fundamentally oppressive and untruthful. And I know what you're thinking. Wow, they really are depressed. Well, joke's on you, because this is the part of the video we started filming after I started taking antidepressants. There are plenty of categorical things that we can say about mental illness without falling down the Foucault. As we said, depression is common, so is mental illness broadly. And everyone will have it. Well, not quite. But as much as makes no odds, one in five people will suffer from a mental health condition in any one year. Between 10 and 20% of people will suffer depression in their lifetime. One in three teenagers meet criteria for an anxiety disorder at some point in just their adolescence. 50% of people will be diagnosed with a mental illness in their lifetime. Is it feeling a little closer to home? Maybe less like a lonely prospect. I mean, I kind of wish someone had told me how common depressive episodes are, you know, in primary school, or if they could have worked it into the Lion King or something. As well as being common, mental health disorders are, often, horrible. We tend to describe symptoms in medicine. Symptoms, side effects, measurable deteriorations and behaviours and visible scars and so forth. But in the case of mental illness, we can conceive of the internal world, where things are scary or overwhelming. Where there is risk at every turn, betrayal, transformation, cruel intentions. The scary, unpredictable hell of being in this life with these humans. An unreliable and sometimes hellish perception of reality. or the chaos, elation, risk, and, and rush of a manic episode. Or, like me, the crushing darkness and inability, self-disgust, and on again, off again, love affair with the prospect of dying. Traditionally, public health disorders were assessed purely based on mortality rate. If it leads to death, it's a problem. Morbidity, medical consequences of living with the disease, weren't seen as important. The thing is, a lot of terrible health conditions aren't fatal. 
Someone with depression might not actually be in imminent danger of death, but that doesn't mean that they're living a full life. They may languish socially, may spend weeks in bed, may have trouble feeling anything but sadness, if they can even feel sadness. They may cling to or return to closets, may lose friendships, jobs, or relationships. Take away the exclusive focus on mortality and the public health framework looks really different. Mental health, neurological, and substance use disorders account for 13% of the global burden of disease. That's a higher number than both cancer and cardiovascular disease. And here we are back at categorization because it can be tricky to even come to a consensus about what we mean by mental illness, which conditions fall under that umbrella and which don't. Hret syndrome, for example, which is a developmental disorder marked by impaired language and motor function. It was added to the DSM, the US-based Bible for diagnosing mental health conditions, in 1994, but it was taken out as a standalone condition in 2013 because scientists discovered the cause of the disorder, a gene mutation on the X chromosome, making it a genetically-based neurological condition. Now, that reclassification doesn't actually change the lived reality of the AFAB people who have Rett syndrome. Neither will the symptoms and experiences of people with schizophrenia change if it gets reclassified as a neurological condition, a move some researchers and patients are advocating for to reduce stigma and increase funding. Some experts have advocated for dropping the dichotomy between mental health and neurological conditions altogether because mental health conditions seem to have roots in the nervous system and neurological conditions are heavily impacted by the social world. And the focus on boxes and categorization might just be bollocks. They're all partially neurological, they're all social, they're all psychiatric. This move to reclassify people with schizophrenia is primarily to reduce stigma because one of these arbitrary and man-made categories is more sympathetic than the other. And isn't that just silly? One of the terms of art that academics have started using is MNS conditions. The M standing for mental, the N for neurological, and the S either substance use or psychosocial disorders. I don't know. It means that we don't have to get lost in a debate about whether something is based in the brain or in the mind or the social framework. For the sake of being able to have a messy conversation, we're going to have to use some imperfect terms. And that can make things tricky. Because there are some conditions that feel like real true disabilities, and there are other conditions that are simply ways of being, and others still that are best thought of as identities. We're going to be talking about things like disability, and I don't know how well that term sits with, for example, an autistic person. You can understand how plenty of autistic people wouldn't think of the way they move through the world as a disability, but you can also think of autistic people looking for resources or accommodations in an insurance-based healthcare system or in the education system, kind of needing the disability word in at least a couple of places on the form. And that's part of the point. Forms, self-reporting, categorization, labels, even something as definitively mental illnessy as psychosis can be a really different category for people who find the medical model helpful than it is for those invested in mad pride. There can be a deep distrust of these labels and systems of care, and unfortunately, as is often the case with big systems invented by a history of the West, of powerful, rich, and largely stupid as fuck white men, some of that distrust is pretty justified. In the 1800s in the southern United States, a new condition Trapetomania was described by physician and bastard Samuel A. Cartwright. It was characterized by a sudden irrational urge to break free from the plantation, observed only in the black slaves of the time. Why, certain white thinkers wondered, would the slaves with their carefully curated lives want to run such risk to escape? It must and can only be madness. In noticing a disease not heretofore classified among the long list of maladies that man is subject to, it was necessary to have a new term to express it. The cause in most of cases that induces the negro to run away from service is as much a disease of the mind as any other species of mental alienation, and much more curable as a general rule. Cartwright's preventative measure was... Whipping the devil out of them. Surprise, surprise. And no, that was not a particularly popular nor well-respected theory, especially in the Union of the Northern States, but it does show that a category can be simply invented by some cunt and plenty of us will just go along with it. And that, as a problem, is going to be very relevant at several points in this evening you are so graciously wasting with us. Other, more long-lasting and pernicious medical misconceptions are well known to the black community, like the ridiculous and convenient invention that black people have a greater pain threshold, or don't experience pain in the same way at all, or have literally thicker skin which, ridiculous as it sounds, all demonstrably pervades and has an actual impact on care when measuring the attitudes of medical professionals and in terms of the experience of care for black people. The history that leads up to this biased treatment is a grim and gruesome reminder of just how lacking in benevolence research and medicine can at times be. 
Well into the 20th century, researchers continued to experiment on black people based in part on the assumption that the black body was more resilient to pain and injury. The military covertly tested mustard gas and other chemicals on black soldiers during World War II, and the U.S. Public Health Service, in collaboration with the Tuskegee Institute, studied the progression of untreated syphilis in black men from 1932 to 1972. The experience with medicine can be even worse for black women. When they appear in emergency rooms with symptoms of heart attacks, black women are less likely to be triaged as experiencing an emergency. Instead, they sit in the waiting room for longer than white people before being seen by a doctor. When experiencing a time-sensitive medical emergency, this is an unfortunate intersection of racism and misogyny, and American cultural hegemony refusing to engage with the many ways of communicating that exist in the world. It is patriarchy, yes responding with hostility to outward expressions of emotion and pain, even in medicine. Hysteria, the womb-induced madness of women, their diagnosable emotional excess was a truism, a recognized condition for most of recorded history. Every fucking genius from the ancient Egyptians blaming the womb to the Greek physician Hippocrates, yes that one naming the thing, to one Sigmund Freud, attributing hysteria to childhood sexual abuse, which of course had been repressed and so required no evidence. Women were sometimes institutionalized for hysteria. The treatments for hysteria included regular marital sex and impregnation. It's very handy. It's just always been easier to paint women as crazy. It allows men to take less responsibility, but to call more of the shots. And it is functionally unfalsifiable because what are you measuring them against? What is irrational? Can't it just be whatever the woman is doing? Now, some would argue that even though obviously womb-induced madness is a nonsense, still there are biological differences between women and men. Between all women. And all men. I mean, obviously. Julie Bindle and Posey Parker and Kathleen Stock and Jordan Peterson and Matt Walsh and J.K. Rowling are the real feminists. But I can't help but wonder if perhaps our conception of how mad or broken or degenerate other people are is just maybe a little bit socially constructed. How have queer people been treated, or not treated, maybe even tortured, by certain of the medical systems we've created as a society? How have gay and trans people been treated by psychiatrists, by people with qualifications hanging on the wall behind them? Oh wait, you came to us for information. Why am I asking you? Real fucking badly, and, and these are very vulnerable groups. For example, trans and gender diverse people are up to four times more likely to suffer from depression. It's an educational video. I love learning. And while this may seem like a complete rant about racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and cultural hegemony and how in the systems we create this norm and then we measure everything against it and then it can just reify and reinvent all these biases against immigrants and trans people and, and black people and I apologize for ranting. I did warn you that I was depressed. But can you for a moment imagine having one of those identities and trying to figure out where the fuck you even fit in this game of mental health? Yeah. Imagine having a few of those identities. Hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We create categories because at some level at least, we do want to understand and we do want to help. This is not going to be an anti-psychiatric essay. These categories exist for a reason. It's just that sometimes the reasons are helpful and sometimes the reasons are evil. And it's not the worst depression I've ever had, no, not, not by a, a dustman's margin. But it has persisted for more than two weeks. It has affected my work and to a lesser extent my relationships. I'm finding it very hard, for example, to make this essay, or to send a reply to the many messages and posts that make up so much of my life, or to pay bills, or to shave, or to get dressed, or to wash myself, or to be touched. To touch. You listen to anyone talk about anything. To believe in the goodness or worth of people. I'm. I'm finding it hard to exist. And then again, I could be lying. <laughs> lying to myself, maybe. Maybe I'm being lazy. Maybe it's arrested development. Nobody likes paying bills. Nobody likes doing housework. Nobody actually likes being touched. I could be lying because depression or any diagnosis is a, is a get out of jail free card, right? For um, 
I don't know, personal responsibility or something. These days, everybody wants a diagnosis or an identity. Hell, I even use they, them pronouns. So I could be making up anything about myself and also bye to all the people who just stopped watching. I could be a narcissist and just saying I'm depressed. But you can't trust anything I say because what if I'm mentally ill? So, the second video we made for this channel was on narcissistic personality disorder. In the video, we talk sympathetically about the lived experiences of people with NPD, how the condition impacts people, and how it has been unfairly understood and stigmatized in pop culture. But it was our second video, and so it had bad sound, flickering lights, and a few kind of clumsy storytelling bits like the entire DSM diagnostic criteria read word for word while Neil danced. Impairments in personality functioning and the individual- But despite its sloppiness, we got effusive comments on the video and people noticed when we took it down because it's rare to have people talk about narcissism without it descending into stigma and ableism. In the discourse, it seems like there are two kinds of narcissists. There's the kind suffering from fragile self-esteem, blowing up their relationships, suffering from a relatively rare and somewhat arbitrary specification of personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. About 1% of people meet criteria for this diagnosis in the places where the diagnosis shows up, because it's also a culture-bound syndrome, a condition which only seems to appear in certain places, and it can only be diagnosed by trained medical professionals. It's rare, it's hard to spot, it has arbitrary designations, it's a tricky, slippery little beast, and I would advise you to proceed with caution. And then there's the other kind of narcissists, who are people who speak loudly about their achievements, or are women. And this is largely down to the concept of narcissism introduced by one Sigmund Freud. And in classic video essay style, we'll get to that later. But for now, let's stick with the contemporary clinical side of the condition. Though, even with the advent of clinical psychology, a field which has moved to empirically based assumptions, it's been difficult to break the association in the general public's minds from Freud. And worse, there's a whole group of snake oil salesmen, self-help gurus, who make their living denouncing people as narcissists. Today, we're going to be talking about the spiritual consequences of living with a narcissist. Narcissists are especially susceptible because they viewed emotions as a sign of weakness. Now, manipulating a narcissist in the law- I'm a narcissist negotiation expert. Social narcissism reflects our current cultural reality. Some of these people have nothing more than persuasive language, caftans, and statement necklaces but some have actual PhDs. Some even aren't trying to contribute to a misunderstanding about narcissism. The disorder of narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder, is one characterized by having a very fragile and easily threatened sense of self-esteem and is often examined by clinical psychologists. But things get even more complicated when you throw in another branch of psychology, social psychology. That's a group that's pretty in love with creating categories of people. They also use the word narcissism, but to describe a trait, not a condition. <clears throat> uh, could we actually do that one more time because it's real fucking important. A trait, not a condition. You can be high in extroversion and high in narcissism, for example. It doesn't mean that you have MPD. And confusingly, their definition of narcissistic traits actually varies radically from narcissistic personality disorder. Narcissistic traits don't focus on an issue with regulating self-esteem like the disorder, but instead are characterized by things like assertiveness, extroversion, and high self-esteem. Papers talking about narcissism as a trait are the ones likeliest to say a cohort of people are more narcissistic. They're using this definition, often measured by a test called the NPI. And funnily enough, when you test people with NPD on the NPI, people with clinical narcissism on this test of trait narcissism, they do not score high as a population. Their mean scores are the same as the mean scores of the general population. When someone can say they're sure their terrible ex is a narcissist because they read it in a self-help book written by a social psychologist who has never interacted with a patient in their lives, it's preposterous. And the most important thing for a lay person to know about NPD is that people with the disorder suffer. The suffering is a key part of the diagnostic criteria. You can't have all the outward symptoms of NPD without the suffering and still have NPD. The suffering is the thing that drives the behavior. The suffering comes in the form of insecurity, shame, humiliation, and depression. 
Evidence suggests that many people with NPD were abused as children. The behaviors of someone with NPD are protective. They have fragile self-esteem and feel easily threatened. They have trouble with connection and have to constantly promote themselves like a brand while hiding the real them from friends or family. For many people, it's a lonely, scary disorder to have. And while people with NPD are absolutely as responsible for their actions as anyone else, they are no more likely to be abusive than the general population and they are likelier to have been the victims of abuse. And I wanna pause here and talk about discourse directly for a moment, because abuse is common. And many of you watching have been abused by someone with NPD, and I am not trying to make you feel sympathy for your abuser. Fuck that. But I do worry that some of you are falling into a trap because of the way NPD gets conceptualized, because two things are at play here, illness and power. It's easier to give an example, so let me give one from the US. In the US, there are biases that both women and Asian people can't drive well. If you are in traffic and get cut off, look over to the car and see a non-racialized middle-aged dude, you might think, What an asshole! Whereas, if the same thing were to happen to you and you saw that the person was a middle-aged Asian woman, you might say, Eh, uh, nope. No, won't be doing that. That's not even a stereotype in my country. Fine. I'll do it myself, you might say, ah, oh, Asian women can't drive. In one case, the individual represented himself. In the other, the individual represented the entirety of a race and gender. That often happens with disenfranchised groups. And I don't think anyone watching this video this far is going to fall for something like reverse racism. But still, let's just say for the record, when you're making an individual a representation of a broader group, power also comes into play. If your landlord fucks you over, it might be because they're individually an asshole. But it's also fair to blame the system that gives them that much power over you in the first place. Fuck all landlords. In a bad way, not the good way. Don't have sex with a landlord. But NPD is not a disorder that makes people more powerful or more successful. NPD isn't a stand-in for the social environment which creates conditions for abuse. NPD is a disability. When you decide that people with this condition are abusers, you're not speaking truth to power. You're being ableist. But this isn't the narcissism video essay. And while NPD gets projected on men in power, a critique of an individual rather than a critique of the structural environment, it culturally has a mirror condition, which is just as misunderstood, just as stigmatized, BPD or borderline personality disorder is another such evil person disorder except this one in the cultural environment gets associated with women. But let's look at it clinically first. Borderline personality disorder is characterized by fluctuating identity. Like people with NPD may compensate for the fluctuations in their self-esteem by trying to project self-importance, people with BPD may compensate for their fluctuating identity by throwing themselves into different careers or relationships or social groups, trying to cover up a gnawing sense of chronic emptiness. Like narcissistic personality disorder, it's often used as a shorthand for bad person. And again, like NPD, there's good evidence that it develops as a result of childhood experiences of abuse or neglect. And it's one of the conditions with the highest rates of death by suicide. Frankly, wow. sounds like a pretty shit disorder to have. And there's been treatments developed for both BPD and NPD, evidence-based treatments that help people with personality disorders have a better time regulating emotions, forming healthier connections to others, feeling less pain. But if you Google either disorder, you're not likely to get sympathetic info written for someone with a health condition. It's also important to not look up the diagnosis online before we have a chance to get into it, okay? You might find the real information terrifying. Or you might find articles like this. That seems helpful. Not just ableism, but misogyny on top. Brilliant. Like, wouldn't you love to go to the doctor being like, I'm in pain, and they're like, cool, you have this disease called cancer, it's treatable, but you're kind of a universal villain now, and also, women can't drive. People's discourse here, carelessly or not, working to make terminology of these illnesses synonymous with being abusive, it's not, working to make the lives of people with MNS worse in general, 
And in the case of personality disorders, the rhetoric and bias, it's so bad that often mental health professionals won't even treat people with them. And every single one of the people who have speculated about which celebrity or politician or even horrible historical figure has some specific disorder, everyone who's done that is part of the problem. And for every person who insists that they need to diagnose this or that politician as having NPD specifically, or this female actress as being quintessentially BPD, and you're just certain, certain that those labels fit. Let me suggest that instead of the DSM, a book that, yes, synthesizes expert knowledge on diagnosing MS conditions, but also exists to categorize people for the benefit of insurance companies in the US specifically, let me suggest that instead you look at the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, an alternative diagnostic guide with a less corporate and more global reach. And if you look up NPD in the last few versions of the ICD, you'll be disappointed. Same if you look up BPD. There are still categories for people with personality disorders, people who have impaired functioning in their sense of self and their interpersonal functioning, but the specific terms have been dissolved. They're mostly unhelpful. Instead, under this guide, people experiencing this type of distress will be diagnosed as one thing, personality disorder, mild, moderate, or severe. Maybe some of the greatest medical minds notice how meaningless the word narcissist had become. But just as a note, if you have one of these disorders and you find the term useful, you can still use it. Identity is more complicated than diagnosis. Whatever you feel communicates your internal world to the outside is useful. But for all the people insisting on rigid ways of categorizing others, BPD investigating the female celebrities who make them mad, so many of the world's experts look at that mess of human suffering and go, uh. Is this one disorder? Is this many disorders? Is this just a way to categorize difficult people? For the sake of being helpful, let's draw some squishy lines around our best guess. Subject, of course, to change. I'm in no position to make this video, but let's do it anyway. So here, you can see us trying to make damn sure to be watertight and convincing. I mean, we always try to do that, but honestly, this time it's because I'm afraid of you. I am afraid of you. You have the power right now to leave a comment that could devastate me. You have the power on social media to do that to loads of people. For some, it is a full-time hobby. For others, a misguided attempt at something else. For many, a necessary slash fun slash lesser of two evils slash whatever the hell something something freedom. But the power is real and we speculate on, comment, judge, and diagnose all kinds of people all kinds of the time. And I am fucked right now, emotionally. Here I am. Here I am, come get me, hurt me. Why am I doing this? Care to speculate in some masochistic tendencies as a result of low self-esteem? Some autogynophilic pathological misogyny where my willful misconceptions about what it means to be feminine causes me to project a need to be hurt. Just like how I want to hurt women or something. Oedipal, Fredipal, incredible. No. Maybe it's some kind of messiah complex mixed up with main character syndrome where uh, my need to bleed out like an artist, like a CJ the X is a veiled way of maintaining control. Or I'm just pulling your leg and I'm depressed. So let's just talk about expertise for a moment, shall we? More tea, Sarah. Hi. It's expertise time. According to the American Psychiatric Association, the DSM-5's task force and 13 work groups include more than 160 mental health and medical professionals who are leaders in their respective fields. The task force oversees the entire project, while members of the work groups bring specific expertise in the various subspecialties of mental health. Each task force and work group member has contributed hundreds of hours to the task of updating and improving the DSM. Now, I know that there is distrust of this idea of experts and leaders in their field. Hell, we're leaning into that distrust and paying credence to the legitimate concerns. But if we can just take a moment to contemplate that level of collective knowledge and collaboration, that's not a bohemian couple in Ireland doing some research and making a video essay. That's 160 leaders in their fields. The sort of shit that gets people to the fucking moon. And experts who are deeply invested in their given field tend to be very bad company at parties. 
If you talk to a physicist and say, hey, I heard that black holes are evidence of holographic theory, they're gonna go. And if you speak to a linguistic anthropologist and say, I heard there are languages where you can't say yes or no, they're gonna go. And if you speak to a medical doctor and say, I looked up my symptoms and I think I have a weird presentation of a rare condition, they're gonna go. The way I like to think of this, at its absolute fairest, is that you wouldn't expect to achieve fluency in a foreign language by looking up direct translations on Google Translate. Sure, if you want to say, beg your pardon, in Irish, you could look up each word and end up with some mess like, impig de loch. But that is not what we say in Irish. That's like, beg the remit that you own or something, it's garbage. We say, gav mleshkeil, which in English uh, is maybe more like, catch my excuse, uh, take a hold of my excuse there, will you? Because uh, language is contextual, cultural. We don't all say things the same way as each other. In Finnish, they have the gender neutral pronoun han, and teachers use it without feeling the need to start a tribunal. In Dravidian, for example, there's a phenomenon of clusivity, where you can distinguish between a we that is inclusive, like Sarah, me, and all of you, and a we that is exclusive, it's Sarah and me, and, and you, no. Fuck off. What we're saying is you can't really fully understand something just by mimicking its vocabulary. You have to understand purpose, style, grammar, and context too. Also, you can't impose meaning from your non-expert perspective, or at least you can, but you're essentially guessing or possibly even doing harm. That happens even within cultures. There's a split between older and younger English speakers for what to say after somebody says, Thank you. Older people tend to say, You're welcome. Which sounds rude to younger people, and younger people tend to say, No worries. Which sounds rude to older people. We want to be polite, but that exact kind of politeness isn't universal. And when there can be so much potential cultural misunderstanding around a phrase that's just meant to be robotically repeated to be polite, well, you can imagine how tricky it gets when people who have been steeped in technical definitions interact with people who have lay definitions. I can't emphasize enough on the importance of making sure our patients actually understand what we're telling them. I recently met a patient with worsening cancer burden that all this time thought she was getting better because her doctors had told her she was progressing. She interpreted it as she was making good progress and not as the disease is progressing. Needless to say, she was completely appalled when I went through all of her recent imaging and explained her disease was actually getting worse. Experts in all fields, if they're worth their salt, will be very cautious to be sure about things. Medical doctors will recognize that what they're doing is at least partially guesswork, an art form, where they're whittling away at all the possibilities that might be least likely to explain your pain, your diarrhea, your headaches. This is not to discount the fact that some people are taken less seriously by doctors. That is absolutely the case, as we pointed out earlier. But it is also the case that even when doctors take things incredibly seriously, that doesn't necessarily look like a tidy diagnosis. The doctors will ask about the normal presentation and then go into other diseases that it might be, but that's not you being dismissed because medicine is as much an art form as it is a science. And a lot of the ways doctors are trained to diagnose is to go with the most likely options and eliminate possibilities. The principle of parsimony. It's totally possible that you have the rare presentation of a disorder which you found on Google. But it's more likely that when a doctor starts asking about your mood that they aren't dismissively saying it's all in your head, but rather are looking at much more common and still debilitating disorders, like depression. I mean, look, Googling your symptoms is an attempt at democratizing knowledge, and that's actually good in practice. But you know what's even gooder? Understanding what the doctor does with the information of those symptoms. A doctor suggesting a diagnosis of anxiety or depression or panic disorder isn't dismissing your physical symptoms. They're looking at what is, statistically, a more likely cause. A doctor dismissing you is serious, and that happens. But a doctor saying it's a mental health condition is offering help. It's just a more stigmatized kind of help than cancer or ulcers. Please, if you take anything from this essay, a mental health diagnosis isn't someone fobbing you off. Being mentally ill is being ill. If we really want to democratize the knowledge underlying best practice for mental illness or neurological conditions, then it would be irresponsible and fruitless to only steal vocabulary. Words like narcissist or trauma or those even more vaguely understood terms like repression or projection because it's obvious language isn't just vocabulary. That's why Google Translate can be such a funny. But equally, expertise is not just vocabulary. So, 
when bad faith actors borrow vocabulary from the experts and rearrange it into a bestseller, they're playing an incredibly dangerous game. When Twitter users or YouTubers use these terms for dunking or faux insight or beefing or bullying or otherwise chasing clicks, they are playing a dangerous game. They reduce the complex to the simple. Experts stand on the shoulders of giants and make decisions by getting, oh, I don't know, 160 of them together and any given discipline involves the culture, the modes, the habits and best practice of that discipline. Cultural anthropologists don't helicopter into remote Alaska and start calling people witch doctors just because that's a word that sometimes comes up in cultural anthropology. They don't go online at 3 a.m. to accuse some landback activist of being shaman just based on the way they tweet. Why do we talk about the unconscious or trauma or narcissism as if we actually know what they mean and how to apply them just like words like butterfly or bicycle or bum bum? Well, it's for lots of reasons. But two of those reasons are called Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. The thing about the cliché of therapy is um, I never really felt middle class enough. Do you know, it always felt like a bit of a wanker endeavour. Uh, plus, um, I think I've always kind of had a bit of imposter syndrome in terms of my depression. You know, there's a simple trick I can use to screen for depression. See if you can spot it. Neil? Yes? Are you depressed? Yes. Did you spot the trick? That's it. Up to 97% of the time, that's effective. One or two questions are all we need. Many studies show that also, I'm sorry to hear that, sweetheart, that sucks. But many studies show that while you can screen for depression a number of ways, and obviously further screening is necessary before prescribing medication, still, the simplest way to initially establish the likelihood of a depression diagnosis for someone is just to ask them. The two recommended questions are, one, during the past month, have you often been bothered by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? And two, during the past month, have you often been bothered by little interest or pleasure in doing things? Yes. Yes, I have. So you're not an imposter. Throughout this essay, I hope we've made it clear that mental health conditions are common, they're normal. Even if the diagnoses are tricky and the definitions are fuzzy, you should take your experience seriously without falling down the Foucault. But we're not here to talk about Foucault. We're here to talk about Freud. We won't do a deep dive on the man himself, we'll leave that for Respect the Dead to cover, but we are going to discuss some of his ideas, because as much as cognitive or behavioural psychologists try to distance themselves from Freud, he still influences not just the public's idea of psychology and human behaviour, but many people working in the field of mental health. Let's back up and say that there are different kinds of psychology, for example, in my psychology undergrad, I oriented heavily towards cognitive and biopsychology, so I read a lot of theory on competing cognitive systems, how we speak, how we learn and remember, how we perceive things, how messages jump between neurons, the heritability of different disorders, that sort of thing. I did still have to study abnormal psych in one intro class in social psych, but Freudian concepts were limited to my history of psychology class, and for a while, I thought the field had moved fully away from Freud, and I was really wrong. Let's go back to narcissism. This social ill and stand in for bad person. The idea of narcissism was first developed by one Sigmund Freud in 1914, and here I'll own my own biases. I think Freud was interesting as a philosopher, but terrible as a scientist. Freud came up with a complex set of theories on how the mind works, which he called psychodynamics. If you're from the global north, you've probably heard of this idea. The you that you think that you are is only one part of your personality the ego. But you have two other driving forces, like individual parts of yourself, the superego, a disciplinarian, and the id, a hedonist. Basically, in Freudian psychology, everyone is a switch. Brilliant analysis! Actually, he didn't conceptualize these so much as competing interests or complex human experiences like lying to oneself or deciding not to think about something because it's painful. No, these are fully formed forces. They're the majority of your personality, and they're hidden, coming only to the surface through dreams or slips of the tongue. 
and psychodynamics refers to the way that these three entities interact. This can get slightly complicated because of terminology. See, if a cognitive psychologist says something is unconscious, they're likely referring to brain processes which happen without our conscious thoughts. Think the pumping of the heart. Or a social psychologist might refer to a split-second decision we make, and we sometimes call that the unconscious, since it's based on quick instinct more than thoughtful consideration. Implicit bias, for example, is based on the idea that we have schematic associations which might impact our choices in split-second decisions, that living under white supremacy will impact our split-second risk assessment when we run into another person on a dark street at night. That concept seems reasonable and is falsifiable, but that's not what psychodynamic practitioners mean when they refer to the unconscious. They're closer to asserting that we have fully formed internal unconscious personalities. I just... no. This idea seems foundational to some people, but it just came out of one guy's head. One guy whose research methods were pretty beyond the pale. His ideas played into a lot of the popular stereotypes and biases we already have, and they took hold pretty strongly in the community, but just, I don't think there's good evidence for them. Basically, if you've had a thought, you've had a thought. But if you haven't had a thought, it's unfalsifiable to say that you've had a secret thought that you don't know about. And maybe telling people that their minds are full of secret thoughts isn't the best first step to treating mental illness. This is sort of an aside, but there are a few ways to differentiate a science from a pseudoscience. We can't just look at whether it is peer-reviewed or whether it's taught at an academic level, because we know that both of those institutions, while maybe good-intentioned, are not free of bias. Philosopher Karl Popper famously called psychodynamics a pseudoscience because it lacks falsifiability, which it does. The fundamental claims of psychodynamics are things we cannot test and cannot prove wrong. We cannot disprove the existence of God, and we cannot disprove the existence of repressed sexual desires or penis envy. He further identified that Freud and many of the proponents of psychodynamics are falling afoul of confirmation bias. I think a good way to describe this is similar to astrology. Say we're going to describe an Aries, like Neil. Bold, brave, headstrong, a leader. Yeah! We can also pull up other figures from history who were also Aries and say, ah, the pattern fits. With the theory confirmed in your mind, you may be tempted to slot everyone into their spots, finding the competing characteristics to explain certain behaviours. Oh, there was a march in Dublin yesterday? I bet Neil the Aries spoke at it, because they're a natural leader. Yeah. Oh, they didn't? Uh, well, you know what? The other speakers look good, and as an Aries, they know, as a real leader, how to delegate and strategically let other people shine. As Popper says. These theories appear to be able to explain practically everything that happened within the fields to which they referred. The study of any of them seemed to have the effect of an intellectual conversion or revelation, opening your eyes to a new truth hidden from those not yet initiated. Once your eyes were thus opened, you saw confirming instances everywhere. The world was full of verifications of the theory. Whatever happened always confirmed it. Thus, its truth appeared manifest, and unbelievers were people who clearly did not want to see the manifest truth, who refused to see it, either because it was against their class interest or because of their repressions, which were still unanalyzed and crying aloud for treatment. I may illustrate this by two very different examples of human behavior. That of a man who pushes a child into the water with the intention of drowning it, and that of a man who sacrifices his life in an attempt to save the child. Each of these two cases can be explained with equal ease in Freudian and Adlerian terms. According to Freud, the first man suffered from repression, say, some component of his Oedipus complex, while the second man had achieved sublimation. I could not think of any human behavior which could not be interpreted in terms of either theory. It was precisely this fact that they always fitted, that they were always confirmed, which in the eyes of their admirers constituted the strongest argument in favor of these theories. It began to dawn on me that this apparent strength was in fact their weakness. And gosh, we wouldn't be agreeing with Popper on everything, not by a greengrocer's long shot. He was a liberal who worked with Thomas Friedman. But other philosophers have also had issues with psychodynamic scientific bona fides. For example, more recently, philosopher Sven Ove Hansen created a list with seven criteria for assessing pseudoscience in the sciences and humanities. When applied to psychodynamic theory, as was the case in a 2021 psychology paper, it highlights numerous issues in the field, including unreplicable studies, truisms based on anecdote, and the disregarding of refuting evidence, concluding that psychodynamics is, by this measure, 
a pseudoscience. Also, the author of that paper has a YouTube channel. It's in Portuguese. It's called uh, Psychosophia. Neither of us speak Portuguese, but if it's as good as a published work, then it might be worth checking out. There aren't a ton of devout psychoanalysts anymore. The people who use Freud's specific treatment method of laying on a couch and going to treatment five days a week. But there are, concerningly, a lot of people who still support psychodynamics, who still use Freud or Jung or Lacan or the other psychodynamic thinkers with actual patients. And here we come to another issue with therapeutic treatment. There is a theory that some call the dodo bird verdict. The idea that specific therapies and approaches don't matter nearly as much as the relationship a patient has with their therapist, which in theory sounds great. But the evidence for this theory is mixed at best. And after reading the more recent publications, I'm really skeptical that this truism is actually true. Which is a problem because there are wildly different types of practitioners depending on where you live. In the US, to be a psychologist you need a PhD, which grants a certain amount of familiarity with the scientific process, research methods, and a familiarity with a depth of literature. But in some places, psychologists may only have a bachelor's degree, and there are also social workers, counsellors, psychotherapists. Some of them have really robust methodology and scientific training, and some of them are completely unregulated. And here it's good to focus in on Ireland. Ireland. Because Ireland is a particular mess when it comes to mental health. To get treatment in Ireland, your first port of call would be a GP. A visit which would cost you 60 euro, who would, in theory, determine how to treat you. With brief intervention, pharmacology, referral to counselling, or specific interventions, amongst other possible treatments. Only 34% of people who are diagnosed with a mental health condition while presenting to a GP get any treatment at all within a two-year period. Those who get referred to counselling may feel like they've run a gauntlet to get adequate treatment. But counselling and psychotherapy are unregulated in Ireland. As of now, anyone can hang up a shingle, having had absolutely no training, or else being trained in methods with no empirical basis, and a not insignificant portion of those counsellors practice psychodynamic therapy, meaning patients are still receiving care based on the mechanisms developed by dear old daddy Psychodynamic psychotherapists support the ideas of the unconscious as conceptualised by Freud and orient their treatment around his ideas of resistance and repression and, oh, the more you, the client, say, that doesn't sound accurate, the more likely it is to be true. Ha! <laughs> I'm right when you say, and I'm even more right when you deny. And look, I'll be honest, I am very sceptical of all of these ideas. <laughs> you don't say. Of the four main psychotherapy approaches, I think there's good evidence for three of them. Cognitive, behavioural, biological, and even humanistic. But psychodynamics just looks like pseudoscience. But we can't just blame Ireland. Look at the states and the qualifications of people who run AA-based treatment programs. Look at the acceptance of life coaches or conversion therapists or counsellors with only religious training, some of whom sometimes get referrals from legitimating pathways like the court system. I'm not even saying these perspectives are bad or unhelpful by default. Undoubtedly, many of you watching will have had positive experiences with a life coach or rabbi. But if mental health disorders are the medical conditions we know them to be, then these folks are more like alternative medicine practitioners. Sometimes helpful, sometimes harmful, but not running on empirical data, and not well positioned to help someone with a serious disorder. So, you make up your own mind, but here's where I stand. Fuck psychodynamics. Fuck the unconscious and fuck the death drive. Fuck the Oedipal complex. That shit was based on sexism and racism and the idea of a rigid hierarchy of insight between the practitioner and the patient. It's dangerous pseudoscience and it too often guides the public's ideas about why people are different and why they suffer. And it leaks down into general society, giving the cover of legitimacy to our pre-existing biases and stigmas. Thank you, Sarah. That was very helpful. Isn't it, isn't it lovely though? These, these bog trees, I don't even know what's going on. Bog's <laughs> magical. Um, 
And actually, the only reason that I'm, uh, I smoke, by the way, but I'm trying to quit, isn't that what everybody says? The only reason I'm on antidepressants is because I was prescribed anti-smoking medication that happens to also be antidepressant. And uh, I started taking the meds to get off these fucking things. And then it was like a fog lifted. <laughs> and I was like, Neil, for fuck's sake, you've been like kind of depressed for like, your whole adult life or or very depressed i knew about those bits but i didn't quite realize that all the rest of it was fucking fixable but i'm very excited i had a therapist once a real one provided to me by the health service executive of the republic of ireland now in order to get one i had to tell my doctor that i thought i was suffering from depressive episodes and he instantly jumped on the phone to get out of that conversation made me a referral and eight short months later i had a shrink that's actually doing quite well. And she was all right. There was a box of tissues, a glass of water, and a small window so I could gaze occasionally into the small, dingy car park of a, a small, dingy health center in a small conservative town where I had the smallest, dirtiest car. I told her about the depressive episodes, about how I was struggling with my then relationship, how I felt I was losing my family, I was. I was struggling with grieving for the passing of my mother and I told her I like to wear women's clothes. <laughs> I remember quite specifically thinking that this therapist was turning up to work in knee-high leather boots and middle skirts and cool things like that and how I was wearing a jumper and jeans with holes in them and second-hand and thrift store garbage and a vague assemblage of male identity that was less egregious than it might have been. How I looked like shit and she looked cool, congruent and I hoped that Maybe she might say something like, Neil, clothes are so arbitrary, you just do you. There's nothing inherently wrong with expressing yourself. That's not what she said. She was pretty uncomfortable. She went, uh, and asked, is it just because it's taboo? Is it a kind of a sexual thing? <laughs> Bear in mind, there was a box of tissues and there was a glass of water. I wasn't entirely on my own, but I was a little put out if I'm honest. I didn't conceive of myself as broken, even back then, but I, I did get this feeling that I would always be perceived as broken, as weird and gross. I didn't have the imagination to know how good it would get. The relationships that I could get into, the new found families, the whole way that my perception of the world would be reframed, because I didn't know any of that. I didn't conceive of a lot about myself back then, and concepts of self, like being sane, being competent, being happy, being normal, are all very much tied up in culture. Very much tied up to victorious, unimpeachable manhood and a given culture's idea of what living a good, normal life is. So if you're up against a kind of limited scope in your culture, and that culture has produced a limited and unevolved healthcare system, the things that might be broken about you could simply be the ignored memos and forgotten meetings and misunderstood medical research that had, at one point, been intended to improve society. How can you conceive of yourself when you're in a mental health crisis and there are things about you that are needlessly socially unacceptable? The DSM has had a complicated relationship with gender, gender identity, sexuality, and fetish, but remember, quite a bit of what the DSM includes, much of what it has historically included, is based on gaining treatment in the USA with an insurance-based healthcare system. It's culturally and pragmatically American. It's not meant to be a condemnation. Often, it doesn't even matter if these are coherent categories, as long as the people affected are getting the right kind of help. And the systems we've designed generally say you won't get help unless you get a label. Because if you don't have a label, there's nothing wrong with you. And if there's nothing wrong with you, then shouldn't you really be at work and not crying? Just prior to the pandemic, Ireland had one of the highest rates of mental illness in Europe, with 18.5% of the population recorded as having a mental health condition. Depression in particular was well over the European average. Though our rate of suicide has been decreasing in the last decade, we are still famously high in both self-harm and death by suicide. Ireland's rate of self-harm and suicide has been tied to alcohol consumption and economic downturns and I'm frankly pretty worried about the current cost of living crisis and how it will impact things going forward. 
Only 10% of the population think that even speaking to a counsellor will help. And, well, who could blame them? We have very low standards and a very mixed bag of mental health care practitioners. Those training right now are still learning Freud and Jung. And often, not just in a here's a history of psychology way, but in a this understanding of the unconscious will help you deal with someone with borderline personality disorder, not that you'll be particularly trained in how to tell that they have that. As we keep indicating, the practice of care in a given culture is cultural. But if you helicoptered in some anthropologists to Ireland, they'd just be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? This isn't how any of this works. And worse, beyond that, Ireland is a semi-colonised state. Our laws and institutions do not reflect an Irish soul. They reflect the penny-pinching and disregard of our former masters, the British. Our institutions in particular are a, a, a callous reflection, non-culture, going back to the mother and baby homes. For those who fell pregnant outside of marriage, you've heard of these? And were put to work and tortured and dehumanised by nuns? The children that were stolen, the estimated 802 children that died inside just one mother and baby home in County Galway during its 36 year operation. And the mental hospitals, the Christian brothers, the clerical ch child sex abuse. <sighs> of course we don't give a fuck about mental health. This keep your head down culture, especially outside of big cities, especially outside of Dublin, especially in the bog, where the smallest expression of eccentricity, like wearing a hat, is either a sign of someone not being right in the head or is certainly fair game for social policing, making fun, slagging off. Sluttiness, talking back, being an effeminate boy, they're all things that could have cost you your life not too recently. In the panopticon of the bog. I'm gonna use some of this struggling to get through it anyway. And if that sounds kind of conservative, well, yeah. Of course, it's not that simple. In the US, in this respect, you've been generally more socially liberal. As a general rule, the instances of mental illness are lower and there's simply more scope for personal expression. Don't tread on me is not all bad. Now, USA, you export individualism to the world. It's part of your global hegemonic cultural takeover. And I think there's an expectation that we'll do it in the same way as you and that it's a good thing. Housing market doesn't think so, but anyway. The consequences for Ireland are mixed because for all our institutional abuse and lies and secrets and Catholic conservatism, it's become something of a truism that we used to do a better job of taking care of one another. We used to have communities. At least, if you were gonna be watched in the panopticon of the bog, you'd have someone making sure you didn't scrape your knee or put your hand on the stove. But in this age of all judgment, no compassion, when I now see people online accusing strangers, celebrities, women, whole groups of people, generations of being broken, whether that's self-obsessed, attention-seeking, hypersexual, closeted, or otherwise sexually fucked up, some kind of lazy, some kind of broken, or narcissistic. Remember that I can be accused of being, and actually worry about myself being narcissistic for the crime of wearing a hat. To me, it exposes something almost religious about all of this. Being Irish, it's too easy for me to join those dots. <laughs> In practical terms, going back to our point about how these categories of disorder are constructed, and they're constructed within cultural frameworks, we've always had a way to talk about the people who were strange, going back to ancient history, people who behaved in ways we couldn't explain, and maybe we didn't like. And we tended to do so, like with so many things, in a mythic way. What I mean is, we used to have a religious language to describe people who were just plain evil and evil or deranged or perverse or damned were all perfectly reasonable things to call people. Evil being a thing you are, not a description of actions, not a consequence of actions, a thing you are. So ask yourself, do we here in reasonable land, in the broad left, still sometimes categorize people as bad, maybe even evil, as a thing they are, not a thing they do? And do we lube up that categorization, <laughs> dissonant as it is in terms of our data-based value system and radical empathy, by strapping random mental illness words onto these people? She's a psycho. He's a narcissist. The conservatives are all crazy. I don't know why I did it like that. that was so good. And I know. I get it. I really do. I get it because I do it. See, these days I get a few more death threats because of more exposure. Well, evocations of my death. Comments that happen to involve hating me and, and wishing me dead. And it's really hard. It's really sad to be that hated. I want to hate back, you know? 
And we all try to be so cool and untouchable, but like for black people, for travelers, for like Jews, for other trans people, for different hated minorities, it's like really overwhelming sometimes. And I want to advocate for radical empathy, even if it's something I really struggle with, because it would be big and brave, I think, but also because I have this sense that the pattern of categorizing the enemy, whoever that enemy is, as mentally ill, is part of a shared vocabulary of mutual destruction. Because the enemy sometimes isn't one of them. Sometimes it's one of us that we're failing to have any empathy for. ago. No, nope, uh, that's embarrassing. I'm going to do it again. A few years ago, I was in a debate with people who I really respect on the idea of compulsory institutionalization, and I found myself being in the uncomfortable position of having one of the strongest viewpoints in the room. For the record, I still think now what I thought then. The whole thing makes me uncomfortable. And while I can see the good in, I don't know, stopping someone in overt crisis from making a life-altering or even life-ending decision, I feel deeply uncomfortable from stopping someone's self-determined actions or being the arbiter of when those actions are self-determined. A psychiatrist colleague of mine who I deeply respect was on the opposing side saying that not only did she feel like people should be protected from self-harm, but that self-harm included embarrassment. To outline her point, she brought up the story of a woman who, in the midst of a manic episode, was painting her front door with her own menstrual blood. Once treated and out of the episode, she was reportedly horrified at her actions and grateful that she had been saved the embarrassment. Now to be clear, if I were painting my house in menstrual blood, it would probably be some ill-conceived feminist statement art, which would be entirely in line with my character. However, if I were doing it while in the midst of a scary delusion, I do think I'd want people to stop me. But that's me now, not me then, I don't know what the me of then would want, and even in this scenario where I'm speaking about myself, I don't want to restrict future me's autonomy. It makes me uncomfortable. I'm not in a job where I have to make these calls the way my friend was. But there is something that we can do. All of us. Because there are two ways that that woman could be saved her embarrassment. One way is for her to be forcibly institutionalized and treated, the other is for all of us to be a lot fucking nicer. That's it. It sounds really simple, but embarrassment, shame, all of those emotions, they're socially derived. Do you remember being a teenager and tripping on the staircase of middle school? Um. Because I'm pretty sure the times I'd do something like that, I'd feel like I wanted to die. Because at that age, not only are you super aware of people's perception of you, but also people are kind of mean. Like, people will overtly make fun of you for falling on the stairs. I don't know, I'm a real klutz. I still trip constantly. But now if I trip in the street, I'm way more likely to have people either ignore me or shoot me a sympathetic smile or come over to me and be like, that curb is a menace, do you need help up? And like, besides the time I broke my foot stepping off of a curb, funny, I don't really remember recent experiences of tripping in public because people are nice about it and it doesn't register in my head as a big deal. I kind of think that a lot of the reasons that it's not okay to have an MNS condition are socially derived. I know a lot of adults with ADHD who thrive in adulthood who had miserable times in school because adulthood allows for more flexibility and tailoring with careers than one-size-fits-all primary school did. Or a lot of people with generalized anxiety disorder who can text rather than call and find that that relieves some of their symptoms. I think a lot of the burden of depression would be eased if jobs were cool with people putting in less work on weeks when they were in a funk, or, you know, if our ability to feed ourselves weren't tied to our ability to work at all. That would be nice for everyone with any disability, wouldn't it? But I do wonder if it were maybe both normalized and accepted that people could be eccentric and that that shouldn't be met with shame and stigmatization, but with acceptance, that would be cool. Maybe one week I could paint my door with menstrual blood and the next week you see me at the school board meeting and say hi and treat me like a normal person. I think that might do the trick, you know? And that leads into one of the most controversial bits of this essay, although it really shouldn't be. 
we're going to talk about Mad Pride. Mad Pride is a movement which seems to start near simultaneously in a few parts of the global north, sometimes under different names like Psychiatric Survivor Pride. Mad Pride sometimes follows on from the traditional anti-psychiatry movement. Some of the members of this group were committed leftists. Some, like Thomas Saz, who wrote The Myth of Mental Illness, were just deeply conservative libertarians. The range of Mad Pride is large and varied and encompasses people who have eschewed meds and treatment and also those who are undergoing treatment and taking meds. The uniting force between these people is a reduction of the stigma of mental illness. I think we're very confused and binary and frantic about thinking about people with MNS disorders as having pride. We tend to see pride movements as being legitimate only in cases where the identity is both stigmatized and unchanging. People who are neurodivergent have been making big strides towards collective celebration and pride. An autistic person can say, these are the cool things about being autistic, and at least in the circles I'm in, that's overtly accepted. But autism isn't contagious and it's not curable, and it fits perfectly into our socially established criteria for which groups are allowed to feel pride. It's the born this way narrative, and it gets allies on board. It's, hey look, we can't help this, so we should celebrate it. And personally, I hate that angle, at least in queer spaces. And I think we can't help this is reductive and boring. And I'd much rather the criteria for celebration was, because it's fucking great to be this way, whether I inherently am or whether I choose to be. So get on board. But that's a whole other essay. But in mental health care, mad pride becomes way more threatening. Because if your illness is something you're proud of, then won't it keep you from getting better? This, as far as I can tell, is the main worry with MNS pride, or at least the mental and psychosocial part of that. That if people identify with their disorder, not only can it be a barrier to them getting better, but it actually might make them more sick. I actually got diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and then stopped meeting criteria, got better, over a decade ago. While the situation which led to the diagnosis still leaves a mark, I still have nightmares and an exaggerated startle reflex, the torturous bit of the disorder is no longer something which plagues me. I actually can think of fond times from the years when I was actively in the grip of that disorder. Remember the years where I didn't sleep at night? and would go on elaborate walks around the city with my own company or hours swinging on these big, excellent metal swing sets. I remember seeing animals like deer and foxes in the middle of the city when no one else was out and it was dark and quiet. I remember once when my anxiety was so bad that I needed to go to the swing sets in a downpour at 2 a.m. and silently some other girl came out of the rain and also went on the swing set and we swung in silence for maybe 20 minutes before, without saying anything, she stopped and walked away into the curtain of rain. I actually fell in love with someone in that period who also didn't sleep at night. For a while, it was a thing I was proud of, that I spent hours walking alone at night, that I wasn't afraid of dark streets or being alone or whatever. It did seem romantic. But frankly, I would trade all of those experiences for not having the really painful experience of PTSD. And even with just that one symptom, I much prefer the fact that for years and years now, I've been able to sleep through the night. So when I hear the argument that identifying with PTSD, making an identity out of an illness, might keep people from getting better, I do find that threatening. I don't want people stuck in that spot. I wouldn't have wanted me stuck in that spot. Most people who get PTSD get better from it, with or without treatment, and the idea of anything disrupting healing for people scares me. <sighs> but not all disorders are PTSD. And not all people are me. And this idea that pride should only be allowed for things that can't be helped or changed, I think that's just as regressive here. Because while the evidence does show that identity can be a barrier to recovery, whatever recovery looks like, that research is actually so nuanced. It's not the identity which is the problem, but the way the identity is framed. For example, in a study following people with severe mental health conditions over time, participants had their recovery facilitated when their identity shifted from patient 
to mental health consumer. And that's not people having to do away with an identity connected to their illness. That's actually strengthening an identity that is still ill, but more related to autonomy and empowerment. In a 2010 paper, authors condense what we know about identity and mental health trajectory into a working model which shows that, yes, people who identify with their diagnosis do sometimes have poor recovery and are even at risk of self-harm. But the trajectory seems primarily determined by the way that identity interacts with hope and self-esteem. Not that having the identity itself keeps people from getting better, but that the hopelessness and shame associated with identity are the things that are dangerous. The entire argument that identifying with a disorder makes it harder to get better is premised on the reality that in the global north, being mentally ill is universally stigmatized. So what better way to mitigate that than pride? Reducing suffering is good, period, and pretty much every MNS condition comes with suffering. But a cure isn't the only way to reduce suffering. There's also symptom management, positive self-regard, and destigmatization. And it's a little fucked for us to be frightened about people banding together and celebrating themselves. It's fucked for us to be saying people only have a right to celebrate who they are if they get closer to approaching normal. And because mental illness is so socially stigmatized, pride seems like a pretty fucking good way of reducing suffering. And maybe, just maybe, pride movements don't lock people into periods where they're most ill. Maybe the two choices aren't between romanticizing mental illness and saying that it is universally and exclusively a burden. Professor K. Redfield Jameson, a clinical psychologist who both specializes in and has bipolar disorder, uses both books and academic articles to illustrate a pathway between craziness and creativity. She points out that amongst artists, there are a higher number of people with mood disorders than in the general population. She acknowledges that the mad genius stereotype can be harmful and can dismiss the individual creativity of the artist. Even so, is it terrible to assume that mental illnesses aren't all bad, that they can shape someone's perspective on the world in a way that can be beautiful or meaningful? Can we say that madness gave nothing to the work of Sylvia Plath or Tennessee Williams? Maybe Van Gogh was inspired by his bouts of madness, or maybe he was hindered by them. It's impossible to say. But I do think the discourse of the impact of mental illness is always exclusively bad smacks of dangerous normativity. Would Neil and I have felt so strongly about making such a nuanced and personal essay if we weren't people who had dealt with mental illness? Sarah K. Reese, a neurodivergent disability rights organizer who is open about being diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder, maintains a blog sharing candid and poetic entries, including examinations of hearing voices. One of their poems goes like this. Home, through rain and night, after a day bright with people, the sons of their hearts, warm company, my house aches ahead on the road, cold and empty, and I feel the chill in my chest, heart constricting. Street lamps pierce me with white knives. Rain falls like swords, and on the road, black water pools like mirrors, and the night gathers close around me. I'm afraid, yes, yes to be alone. Don't, don't be. be. I'll, I'll catch you falling. falling. It hurts, yes. yes. It's also beautiful. Why does the light have to go? Because, because this is where, is where the, the art, art lives. lives. I love the people, their voices. My voice I know. I love the silence, the strength in solitude. We, we walk, walk both worlds. worlds. Will I come back? Always. Am I loved? Always. Let go. The and the fear, fear will ease. ease, yes, burrow down in my heart. This the dance is mine. And those of you on the side of psychiatry may think I'm being too gentle here. Because sometimes mad pride isn't just celebrate the ways madness is beautiful and unique. Sometimes it's throw out your meds and burn down the institutions. And with that, there is always a fear of self-sabotage, self-harm, or even death by suicide. And I'm the wrong person to deliver this part of the essay because I'm not one of the people who wants psychiatry abolished. I would urge anyone watching this who is curious to look at other resources because I don't feel capable of accurately representing abolition. I have too many friends helped by meds and therapy. I have too many friends who are psychiatrists and psychologists to be able to see them as evil. 
I bristle when they're compared to cops. Cops exist exclusively to dominate, punish, and exert control. The psych people I know want to reduce suffering and keep people out of institutions. And because we're all human, it's not the same dichotomy of cops here and disenfranchised people there. Many, if not most, psychiatric professionals are mentally ill too. So while I like early Foucault before he got too comfy with neoliberalism, and while there is more than enough evidence of mental health professionals using psychology to dominate or to reinforce bad social norms or to get things really wrong, I do think there are many other ways they've gotten things really right and have reduced suffering for countless individuals, and I see their profession as tricky and flawed, but potentially very good. But one of the ways I think it can stay mostly good is to keep from giving mental health professionals unlimited power. Doctors, you are fallible, and having accountability is good. Having things in tension is good. Having checks on the system is good. The abolitionist wing of mad pride is a pretty good check. If a big enough contingent of people think your services are dangerous or imperialist, then your duty of care requires that you listen. If service users claim that their institutionalization was more traumatic than their overdose, then something is wrong. These voices should not be discounted. Discounted, ironically, for being from crazy people, they should be listened to. And not tokenistically, either. Because while our current MS treatments work and provide relief for tons of people, we all know that there are plenty we're still failing, and there is something powerful in their aggression. If the goal really is to reduce suffering and not to make everyone act normative, then the voices of mad pride should not be threatening. And if they are, maybe the fault is not with them. Because as the undercover BBC reporter found in their recent investigation into the Edenfield psych unit in Manchester. This patient has a history of self-harm and Cheryl's just dragged her to the floor. Or as the New York Times reported in their recent expose on the troubled teen industry. You do not have this figured out yet. Huge portions of care are shameful and abusive. Harley's been in seclusion for more than two weeks. But as a note, for those involved in Mad Pride, if I can offer advice from over here in the queer movement, just take care to remember that people are different. If you're someone who has found comfort and peace by embracing your voices and writing for the Hearing Voices Network, then that's beautiful. But it's also worth celebrating when someone finds the same peace with antipsychotic medications. It's the same way my queerness has been more tied to family abolition and relationship anarchy than to gay marriage, but that doesn't mean that the monogamous married queers are sellouts or less queer. I hope your pride movement is more expansive and open to difference than ours has been. But with that very small caveat aside, I am with you. Whether as an ally or a member, I think pride is probably the answer here. The suffering is the problem, not the identity. As we titled this essay while we were writing it, it's okay to be mentally ill. But I'd like to offer one more preachy suggestion in this long section, and this one is for everyone. And that's that we all have the chance to participate in mental health care, not just by being patients or doctors or whatever else, but by being sound to each other. I debated telling this story because it risks exoticizing an entire community, including friends of mine, who I don't want categorized into some racist, Eurocentric trope like that of noble savages. Gross. But I've been lucky enough to live in a lot of diverse places, and at one point I lived in this lovely city where there happened to be a man who did not act in normative ways. I suspect, though can't say, that had he been evaluated, he would have met criteria for a more severe mental health condition. All I can say is that there were community supports for him that were not formalized, but nonetheless extremely helpful. Whoever saw him around mealtime invited him to eat with them, and he'd accept. Whoever was nearest him when it started to go dark would take it upon themselves to walk him home. Let me explicitly state that I will not make an argument that community is the answer in lieu of interventions, like medication or therapy. There were limited access to both in this area, and perhaps he could have had greater autonomy or self-direction if he had had access to those. Instead, he was like the 75% of people in low and middle income countries who don't receive treatment for MS conditions. 
a severely unaddressed need. But this also isn't an argument to say that people who aren't in Europe or North America are better at integrating people with MS conditions into their society. Too many people globally live in sheds or are chained up because their family sees no other way to help them. But what this story is meant to be is one concrete example I've seen of a community serving an individual with an MS condition in a way that I want to emulate because he wasn't on his own. He was someone who everyone felt a mutual responsibility for, yes, but beyond that he was also a real member of the community. Everyone, including foreigners like me, knew him by name. Everyone knew his dietary constraints. He could walk where he liked, could speak to who he liked, and he was still treated with dignity. We could, you know, do that too? We could take care of each other. As angry as I am about snake oil salesmen talking about how their ex was anxiously attached, the solution I have isn't to say that care should only be provided by people with degrees, because community support is so powerful it can aid in the reduction of suffering or, in some cases, take it away completely. Let's look at suicide hotlines. While some people may have suicidal ideation for long periods before they act, other people attempt spontaneously. In fact, about a quarter of people who attempt suicide do so within one minute of deciding they should. In multiple studies, around 50% of people hospitalized after surviving suicide report that the period between when they decided and when they attempted was 10 minutes or less. Understanding this is vital to dealing with suicide as a public health condition. Removing common mechanisms of suicide and lengthening the period between contemplation and action tends to keep people alive. Now quickly, this isn't a band-aid. I, I actually know someone whose fiancé died after they decided the crisis was over, when it wasn't. But for many people, giving themselves time, just time, is all it takes for the suicidal crisis to pass without a suicidal action. This is the whole idea behind suicide hotlines. Often people on those lines are not highly trained professionals. They're volunteers, community members. They don't have lists of perfect things to say to keep people alive. What they do have is empathy and listening skills and gentle voices. And by speaking to someone, keeping them on the line, they often shepherd people through the period of direct crisis until they aren't at risk. And this seems to really work. Or there's the friendship bench, an intervention that was much beloved in my master's program. This intervention trains community members on basic principles of CBT, mental health literacy, basic counseling skills. The community members then sit on specific benches, outside, under trees, and speak to people who come by about symptoms of common mental health disorders, like depression. And in a clinical trial, it was really effective when compared to a group receiving enhanced usual care. Do you know how much we, as humans, just want a supportive listener? You can look up Eliza, a computer doctor who was designed in the 1960s to give therapy by mostly just repeating what you said back to you affirmingly. And it helped. Even people who knew that the computer was a computer knew its tricks, they felt better after talking to it. Now we don't use that computer to treat people, I don't think it's been shown to have clinical utility, but in terms of making people feel better, it's a good demonstration that really all you might need to do is listen supportively and talk to each other. We can make the lives of people suffering from mental illness demonstrably better by reducing stigma and offering community support. We can. We just have to have the will to do so. The will to act and the will to see people well. There's no makeup on my hand. I feel a lot better, genuinely. And um, th there's something really helpful for me about passing a, a big artistic bowel movement like this. And also actually like uh, getting to express my non-binary identity for whatever reason just tends to wash away the inability. I don't pretend to understand. But I'm also not really sold in this idea of the ultimate unknowable mystery of the mythic human mind. Like it doesn't seem helpful to me. We either end up fighting woo-woo with woo-woo, or uh, we just don't think about it, Morty. Let me put it like this. Consider your physical health for a moment, if that's not too devastating. 
we tend to be pretty nuanced about that, maybe too nuanced. Like, like maybe you're a little less fit than you'd like, or uh, probably deficient in a couple of vitamins, a little sedentary, maybe you drink, maybe you smoke, uh, but you don't necessarily consider yourself unhealthy. Certainly not ill, you're just like less healthy than you could be. Unless you're super fucking healthy, in which case, fuck you. But we are quite binary when it comes to mental health. You're either mentally ill or you're fine. And some of you watching this right now are mentally ill. Does that mean that the rest of you are fine? But instead of thinking of the mind as like a mystery of myth and meaning and shadow and mania and narcissism and blah blah blah, why can't we just be pragmatic? Your mind is a part of you that can get sick. There's a lot of guesswork involved, but that's true of all medicine, all science. This is a part of the universe that may only be hard to understand because we're too in it. Like standing really close to a rock and not realizing it's Mount Rushmore. We're just too close to the problems and so biased about them and ashamed about them and confused in explaining them to each other and figuring out the right questions that we just get muddled up. And then people like Freud come along and, and, and they say, the rock has revealed to me visions of its true nature and it says that all the women have to play with themselves for me. And it's like, dude, calm down. It's Mount Rushmore. Put your dick away. Researching the like Freud bullshit and, and there are three fixations, oral fixation, anal fixation, and phallic fixation. It's like, is there anything missing from that list, Sigmund? No, no yonic fixation? In all of human psychology, the, all people's minds work the same way and none of them are thinking about pussy. You are a weird man. And then we figure out, for example, empirically, pragmatically, and irrefutably that poverty is a leading cause of mental illness. Well, that's not something they're going to fix, is it? Because we need poor people in order for society to function as it is currently designed to function. Equally, being overworked and alienated are also exacerbating factors in your mental health. But they're not going to fix those either. It's always on you to fix. Because we need people who are overworked and alienated in order for society to function. You're watching this, so you're probably left-leaning and you're probably not wealthy, so... This is the minority you will almost certainly be part of, eventually. Your family, your friends, your children will be part of it. We need people to be unwell, in fact, and at risk in order for society to function. And when I say we, of course the blame lies proportionately with the powerful, the capitalists, the exploiters. But I'm afraid they are not alone in playing this game. Because it's not really fair to just blame the academics and practitioners and snake oil salesmen and pop psychologists and fake therapists for the perpetuation of mistruth and myth and the misappropriation of strict medical terms. Not for the tendency towards normativity nor the suppression of MS pride. That, all of that, I'm afraid, is on us. Expertise is not vocabulary. Expertise is interactive, complex, and experts are doing it the way they're doing it for good fucking reasons. Yes, we certainly can as trans people or neurodivergent people or people of color or people from the mad pride movement criticize the culture of psychology and rightfully so. But people, people reify stigma and people misuse terminology and perpetuate myths. People contribute to the impenetrable noise of mental illness and they sentence themselves to that fate of being socially perceived as fucked up. How often do you hear a group of people being described as crazy in a given week online? How often do you hear the word narcissist? And who is it referring to? Who's making the claim? How often do you hear trauma? And in what wildly varying context? I know, words change and evolve, but let's be real. Let's just be real for a second. It is a cultural moment right now where we are all pretending to be psychiatrists because it's fun. It's fun. It's fun to categorize, to horoscope, to Myers-Briggs, to Hogwarts House, and it's fun to criticize and judge, and it's fun to condemn, and it's fun to write grotesque shit about Amber Heard, and it's fun, and this is a big part of why people do it, I promise you, it is fun to describe the entirety of all trans people as fucked up, mentally ill, autogynophilic, broken people. It's fun to leave mean comments, and it's communal, you can share it with your friends, and it's part of this cultural moment. And it's not like any of this is being particularly well challenged by anyone. It's not like journalists seem to have any fucking clue how to talk about psychology or, 
often how to have any basic understanding of the scientific method at all. And because so many of the conversations and debates are so very both sidesy, there's always the terminal gotcha. You are just one of the crazies, a victim of the social contagion. You're a narcissist. You need therapy. How often do you see that in a given week online? Given how absolutely piss poor our understanding of psychology and mental health actually is, doesn't that feel like the pseudo-intellectual adult equivalent of, I don't have to listen to you because you smell like poo. And as this essay took on its, its weird shape over months and months, I just couldn't get this idea out of my head. Mental illness is the new sin. To be mentally ill is to be irretrievably and wholly broken and wicked and bad. That's the framework. And if you want to dismiss someone as entirely bad and evil, you just have to find a way to attribute their behavior to mental illness. Be they narcissist or TRA or wokey or crazy ex or even anti-vaxxer or GC cultist or president of the United States or just Americans or Brits, kids these days or women. It's gauche to invoke the language of sin now. Obviously some conservatives and religious types still do. Historically, those are the groups that have had no issue with it. Ian Paisley was brilliant at it. But the lefty atheists didn't escape that shit. Like. Former Christians, moralistic, misrepresenting a dogmatic conception of nature and evolution, reinventing something of what we got out of religion. Mostly hierarchies. Because these postmodern days, you have to have a little more tact and style. You have to have the allure of scientific grounding. So the pundits, the politicians, the public figures on the right side of the political divide, they try to invoke science. They misrepresent evolution. They misrepresent history. And boy, do they misrepresent psychology. From the pseudoscience of Freud and Jung to the outright lies of people like Andrew Wakefield or whatever transphobic shit for brains they occasionally wheel out to forge a paper for them. But it is none of it in order to present a rational argument for conservative values or a conservative model of care, because unless frugality is your only bag, and by frugality I mean siphoning money to billionaires, conservative values don't result in good mental health care. They don't foster a culture of curiosity and prove yourself wrong research. They result in Magdalene laundries. And naming a condition to describe the madness of escaping slaves. These days, the preachers are people like Jordan fucking Peterson. <laughs> A literal Jungian psychologist, misrepresenting every science he can get his grubby mitts on, speaking about wickedness and evil and a corrupted world, a corrupted time, a broken generation, a poisonous ideology, the illness, the madness. And if you argue, he can say, well, you clearly have it, or his defenders can say it, or, or just the random people chancing upon these public debates can say, well, hang on, because they, they are a bit strange. Maybe they are mentally ill. The most powerful force of othering now is the misappropriation of language once intended to heal the sick and suffering. It is wielded to destroy and subjugate whole categories of non-white, non-male, non-straight, non-cis, non-English speaking people. It is the bile of a God-fearing zealot like Ian Paisley transformed into rationality by the poisoning of vocabulary and categories that could be healing all of us. And the most tragic part of all, is that it's us doing it too. We are engaging wholeheartedly in this brilliantly disguised ableism because we all want to seem smart, because it's fun to categorize, and because it's easy to say that actually it's the conservatives that are crazy. It's the bad eggs, the toxic exes. It's the narcissist Donald Trump. It's the addict Jordan Peterson. It's not me in my armchair playing along at home. Expertise is not vocabulary. And managing to not be mentally ill is not a virtue. It's either luck, or it's privilege, or it's a lie. The people around you are, like the heavy drinker or the sedentary vitamin D deficient stoner, all mostly a little unhealthy right now. Mentally. Your friends, your family, you, and any number of you could crack. This badness we are so afraid of. So afraid that people will find out. What if they know how bad and broken and unlovable I am? Well, you're fucking not, okay? You're not broken. You're not unlovable. And it is this world of ours that is the failure, not you. 
I'm so lucky. I'm on antidepressants. I have a good affirming community around me who use they them to refer to me because that's who I am and they understand who I am. They like that I'm a little weird. So I am a little weird. Like what's with the duck costume? Have you been wondering? My mom actually handmade this for me when I was 16 because I thought it would be a good idea to wear a big duck costume playing bass on stage with my band. And now it is the weirdest way to remember her. And I like shit like that. And, and my community gets that. And they understand when I disappear and they're kind to me when I tell them I'm sick with depression. Also, I'm lucky to have a partner who not only loves me for who I am, but can help me to understand how this all actually works. One who is cautious and has taught me to be cautious, such that I respect expertise in the process, but I still reject the status quo. I still believe that we all have to fight for the damn simple right to be who we are. I am depressed. I have depression. I am not broken. I am not a sinner. I am not degenerate. I am not a failure. I just get depressed sometimes. And I'm not afraid to tell you anymore. I've been hunted, I've been roaming, I've been fucked and I've been homeless, I've been every kind of problem since I started making waves. I've been poor and I've been fasted, I've been off my tits and acid, I've been caught inside the drain since I've been circling the grave. The people all around me couldn't tell me how to breathe, I'd obfuscate and suffocate and terrorize my needs. I've given up on everything and dressed myself in rags, but nothing's quite as hard as a giving up the fags. Nothing's quite as hard as a giving up the fags. I've given up the television, bad jokes, and repetition, bad jokes, and repetition, every kind of trope. I've given up and winning, having the crack and being a sinner, having a scrap of food for dinner, repetition and bad jokes. The people all around me couldn't tell me how to drive. I wouldn't get my license till test number five. I'm carrying the shopping because I've given up on fags. But nothing's quite as hard as a giving up the fags. Nothing's quite as hard as a giving up the fags. Nothing's quite as hard as a giving up the fags. Please consider subscribing to our Patreon. Uh, we didn't get a sponsor for this video because we thought it had to be perfect. And it was real hard. And we're tired. Thank you.